Welcome to Ordinary Things, where ordinary things are explained. Today's ordinary thing? Windows, also known as walls that you can fall out of. But what are windows? Windows are an opening constructed in a wall, roof or door in order to admit light and or air into an enclosed space. Today, windows are so ubiquitous that if you find yourself in a room without them, someone's probably either trying to take your money or your organs, but there was a time when they weren't so commonplace. So where did windows come from? Our definition of windows is now inseparable from the superheated see-through beach pebbles we call glass, but until the 17th century, glass windows were an extreme rarity. For the first half of human history, windows were made from nothing, as they were unglazed openings usually carved into the roof to admit light, air, and the occasional bird shit. When windows moved to the walls, they were sometimes filled with semi-translucent material like paper or thin slices of marble. One popular medieval practice involved the use of animal horns, which were soaked, flattened and then shaped into a rudimentary paint. While people couldn't see out of their windows in the medieval period, there wasn't much to look at, other than plague victim piles, open sewer systems and the dark. There is evidence of clear glass panes being produced as early as the 2nd century, but it was an expensive process that produced an extremely fragile product, much like British boarding schools. So it would be another thousand years before glass windows truly came into the frame. When glass windows first began to proliferate in the 16th century, it was only in grand public buildings like churches or in the homes of the transparently wealthy. Windows were a treasured possession of those who could afford them. The owners of Annick Castle actually packed and stored their windows whenever they were away, apparently more concerned with their windows breaking than someone breaking in. In 1590, Bess of Hardwick began construction on Hardwick Hall, a stately home so replete with glass windows that it earned the popular rhyme, Hardwick Hall, more glass than wall. Coming from modest origins, the formidable Bess of Hardwick was the Alex Honnold of Elizabethan social climbers. By the time she moved into Hardwick Hall, Bess was the second richest woman in England, second only to the Queen herself. She achieved her position through a string of financially beneficial marriages, which in turn led to a series of lucrative inheritances. <laughs> Despite glass being incredibly expensive, you can always rely on one group of insane fundamentalists to spend ridiculous sums of money on essentially decorative features. No, not Apple fans, the Catholic Church. Jesus said that he was the light of the world, so in a superb act of brand association, the Catholic Church leapt on stained glass windows as a symbolic mainstay. While the Catholic Church loved pretty glass, it hated couples getting divorced. And strangely, it was this stance that indirectly led to stained glass being virtually eradicated from 16th century Britain. How, you ask? I shall tell you, YouTube audience. When Henry VIII wasn't beheading his wives, he was divorcing them. But in order to indulge his hobby of spousal collection slash disassembly, he first had to renounce the Catholic Church as England's state religion. English Protestants got very excited about this idea, which led to a series of country-wide reforms known as the Reformation. The Bible was translated into English, the monasteries were dissolved, and Catholics were turned into human pizza slices. Stained glass was another casualty, as it was seen as a form of idolatry. This inspired a nationwide smashing campaign that was both a terrific cultural loss and probably a great day out. While stained glass did eventually make a comeback, very little survives from the era. Today, windows are less controversial, and now there are many different kinds of windows. This is a transom window. This is a French window. This is a bay window. This is a Michael Bay window. And this is a kangaroo being launched into an active volcano. Fenestration is the process of arranging and designing windows in a building, whereas defenestration is the process of throwing someone out of a window, and is probably my favourite word in the English language. And there have been many significant historical examples. Welcome to Top of the Drops, bringing defenestration to the nation. At number 5, the original biblical bad girl, Jezebel. Thrown from her palace window, it was said that her body was left in the street and later eaten by wild dogs. Rough. Falling to number four, it's Abe Kid Twist Rellies, mob hitman turned snitch who fell from the fifth floor of his hotel in 1941, the day he was meant to testify against his mafia bosses. Now that's a smash hit. At number three, started at the top, now we hear, it's Gaspar de la Colonne, belted from his bedroom window in 1572 after being stabbed and before being beheaded. Fatality. At number two, it's fallen Frank Olson, the American bacteriologist who fell to his death from a 10-story New York City hotel room after being secretly dosed with LSD by the CIA. Now that's what I call a bad trip. And at number one, holding the position for a record four centuries, that's right, it's the defenestration of Prague. This classic triple victim toss takes top place as it directly led to the Thirty Year War, one of Europe's longest, bloodiest conflicts. <laughs> 
In 1696, King William III instituted the Window Tax, which was a tax on windows. Duh. In an act of passive-aggressive tax evasion, many wealthy homeowners decided to replace their windows with bricks. So next time you see one of these bricked-up former windows, let it be a reminder that rich people would rather sit and fester in a dark, airless, fart-filled room than pay their taxes. <laughs> In 1832, the Chance Brothers pioneered the production of sheet glass. Suddenly, glass could be used almost frivolously, and the Victorians went simply gaga for glass. Even working-class homes could now afford glass windows, and the greenhouse became the must-have product of the 1840s. Glass mania reached its peak in 1851 with the construction of the Crystal Palace, a gargantuan structure of iron and glass that was built to house the Great Exhibition. The palace was designed by Joseph Paxton, who had no formal training as an architect and was actually a gardener by trade, best known for his innovations with that Victorian favourite, the greenhouse. The Great Exhibition was a sensation, attracting over 6 million admissions during its entire run, which was about double the population of London at the time, and about the same as the population of an average London tube carriage today. Among its 13,000 exhibits, the Great Exhibition showed off the world's largest diamond, the world's largest mirror, the world's first voting machine, and the first flushing toilets open to the public. The Crystal Palace would stand for another 84 years, until 1937, when a small fire in the ladies' cloakroom built into a destructive blaze. After eight decades of direct, magnified sunlight, everything made of wood in the palace was as dried out and flammable as Rory Stewart's oily face. The fire was so large that it was visible over 40 miles away, and Winston Churchill declared the destruction of the palace the end of an age. This has been Ordinary Things. If you want to know more about Ordinary Things, please subscribe to the Ordinary Things YouTube channel, and click the bell so the next Ordinary Thing can be delivered straight to your face.